Join me too. And we're going to talk about making mead. And we are fairly excited about this. So I think it would be a good idea to kind of go over what mead even is before we get into how we make it. So welcome everyone who is here. And should we get started or should we give people a minute to jump on? I think we we'll just get started. So, mead is honey wine, essentially. Technically, mead is just the honey water version, but when you add fruit, it's then called melomel. Yeah, so it's technically called melomel, but I think that confuses people more. So we just call it mead. Yeah, we just call it mead for simplicity. So I had a few here to just show you some examples of different ones. This is a sour cherry. I love the beautiful color. This is grapefruit and rose. And this one is one that nobody can ever guess what fruit it is. So tell me what fruit do you think this is? I'm just gonna tell you, it's strawberries. Like you would think if sour cherries make this color, wouldn't strawberries make that color? No, they don't. So let's jump into prepping this. And you guys can ask questions. If I miss them, I have a couple moderators on the comments right now. And one of them is texting me questions that will pop up on my computer to the side here. So if I miss your question, I didn't actually miss it. I will answer it. I just haven't got to it yet. So actually, could you call my kettle? Yeah. The video started before the kettle boiled. So to make a batch of mead, I need to adjust this up here. There we go. So to make a batch of mead, the ingredients are very simple. We need honey. And with the ingredients being simple, the quality of the ingredients also matters. So you need raw honey that is low processed. Some raw honey is actually still gently heat treated for it to filter. So they call it raw honey and technically it's raw honey, but it's actually been heated enough that the yeasts have died. And then you don't, you need those yeasts to make the fermentation happen. So did I give a good description of that? Yeah. So your best bet is, to get, is to get it from a beekeeper. Like this is honey from our own hives. We do buy honey from beekeeper friends to make it as well. And I don't know if you can see, but like you can see little bitties there. It's not filtered at all. But you know what? That all adds goodness. I made one that I'll show you later. But yes, your best bet, source your honey from a beekeeper. Or get your own bees. Or get your own bees. Um, <laughs> next step is water. And water is important too. Um, your water needs to be non-chlorinated. Our tap water is chlorinated, so either we run water through our Berkey, which is our drinking water, or if Mary's is making like a five gallon batch of mead, he, you can just leave water out. Um, chlorinated water. You can leave chlorinated water out uncovered and it will off gas and you can use it and it's just fine. So we'll just use a food grade five gallon bucket and put like a tea towel or something just to keep like flies or whatever from going in because yes, there's flies in our house. So water. Mary's is grandpa. We, have a mesh bag. we do have this mesh straining bag too. Hmm? Sure, grab it. That fits over top of a bucket. I was gonna tell a story about your grandpa. Go for it. Um, I, so I, it's hard to see the comments sometimes. Um, okay, someone said, so please get and use proper airlocks when fermenting meads and wines. Actually, it's not necessary. Um, you can make your own airlock with a balloon with a hole pricked in it, and we have fermented much alcohol this way. Yes, an airlock, this is an airlock. Yes, an airlock is simpler, but you can actually just use a small mouth, like small neck bottle and put a balloon. I like to buy a helium quality balloon because they're thicker. You poke a couple holes in it so that oxygen, uh, sorry, carbon dioxide can get out, but oxygen can't get back in. And 
we made great mead this way. Okay, so these, I think they're called like a straining bag. I forget what they were labeled on Amazon. I think I bought them for straining honey to get like, no, I got them for straining honey to get the wax cappings out. But what they really work well at is they fit over top of a five gallon bucket. So when we're making big batches of mead, this keeps the bugs out. The flies will come. Yes, the flies will come. By the thousands. <laughs> okay, Mary, someone is wondering if they can use some fermented honey in mead. Um, I've never heard of that. Fermented so, honey? like, if you pull honey off, you know how, like, we try to only pull honey that's capped? Mm -hmm. If honey is not capped, the moisture level is not perfect in the honey, and if you spun too much uncapped honey, your honey will have a higher moisture level, so it's not pure, and then it can ferment. That I don't know. I've never You gotta tried. speak louder. That I don't know. I've never tried with fermented honey. Have we had any? We've never had it, but I do know Jessica Three Rivers Homestead, she had some honey that fermented, and she used this mead recipe to make it, but that was within the last month or two, so it's probably still doing its thing. So I would reach out to her and ask her. I don't see why not, but I don't know. Yeah. As long as it's not pasteurized and it still has yeast in it, you should be able to make meat with it. Yeah, it's almost like a yeast starter in its own. Yeah, we should try it, see what happens. We don't have any. We should get some. <laughs> okay, so we have the honey, we have the water, and the next part is the fruit. I didn't pull my fruit out from the freezer last night. You can use fresh or frozen fruit. So I put the oven on just like keep warm and thaw it out. I have huckleberries, which are a regional name I've learned. There's a lot of names. There's a lot of berries that people call huckleberries. But for us, they are like a wild blueberry that's more intense. Um, like a blueberry is actually white on the inside, whereas a huckleberry is like dark all the way through. They're, they're super intense and flavorful. And they are something that we can pick wild here. They're hard to pick. Um, but On a good year, they're easy to pick. Yeah, the bushes are like this high. They get bigger. Yeah. Like, they're still pretty short. So you pick <laughs> squatted like a bear moving along. I'm really good at doing it, but I get lots of leaves in my berries where he gets no berry, he gets no leaves in his berries but he picks slower, but I can pick faster, but I get leaves in my berries, so. The time you spend cleaning. I don't clean them. I, them. I throw yeah, them into the a smoothie, leaves and all. There's not that many leaves in it. Okay, so the berries you use are also, or the fruit you use is also plays a factor in your yeast. So something like this, that is a wild berry from like way up a back road, it's not sprayed in a cut block in a, yeah in a cut block um it's not sprayed it's not been transported and sprayed in transport it's got a lot of yeasts on it and those yeasts help your fermentation so this is why the primary choice is to use wild or homegrown fruit or like unsprayed from a farm where you like you know it's unsprayed however i made this blueberry with conventional store-bought blueberries, but it took two more days. It took more days for the fermentation to start. We were starting to like, oh, maybe this isn't gonna work, and then it did actually take off and work. So there's less yeast on that, so then it took more time for it to do its thing. The next part in the mead I'm gonna check some, a question here. I thought I saw something. Okay. Can you do that on your computer? No, I don't have that coming up on my computer, but mom, my mom and one of my VAs is on comments. So actually mom did send me some. Do fermentation lids work if you use large wide mouth mason jars? Is that what Simon's doing right now? No, he does have a jug with a balloon or did he start some with that? No, he did the balloon jug thing, but he, I gave him all of our mason jar lids. Okay, so we, we do them. have those. <clears throat> those work just fine. Yeah, they are like a plastic mason jar. Actually, you might be talking about something else, but we have, 
mason jar lids that have an airlock this thing in them and it does work well um but i think what you're talking about is there's actually these ones that fit on it's like you'd put this it's like silicone with a nipple and it is essentially like the balloon it lets carbon dioxide out but not oxygen in and it'll work yeah so it replaces having to burn as long as it lets carbon dioxide out, out but no oxygen, no in. oxygen in because if you let oxygen in it becomes a vinegar <laughs> gallons of vinegar we have a five gallon carboy of plum vinegar we've learned this the hard way we need to bottle it because it's probably delicious we just keep not getting to that okay <laughs> so when you if you were to like buy a wine kit and make wine you would have a package of yeast you would have a package of yeast nutrient you would have a package of tannins you would have a package of citric acid like you would have all these different things you have to buy and the whole premise in how marius learned to make mead is your book in here no. he has a book called make mead like a viking no it's the whole premise of this book is that all these things that have been commercialized and made into little packages, you can find in nature. So citric acid, a lemon also adds good flavor. Um, you don't need that to make meat though. Because the fruit does have citric acid, like has acids itself. That like when you're using berries, those have use, yeast nutrients, those have tannins those have citric acid they have all these things in them that you don't need to add it and that's if you were making a mead without fruit in it you would be need to be more intentional like I have one that I'm making without fruit so then I use some black tea as my tannin and I added lemons for my citric acid and those all you know add in and make for a good job there so one thing that we do add which I'm not sure if you really need to add because of all we add, but this is like an insurance policy. We add a dozen organic raisins because organic raisins have so many good yeasts and yeast nutrient all in one. So if you weren't adding fruit, this would be more important to add. Mm -hmm. But like a dozen raisins, like we just... You need that to make meat. You need the yeast. Otherwise, yeah, you need the yeast, but there fly. is yeast in the honey and there is yeast in the fruit. So at this point, the raisins, That's an insurance policy. they're just like a cheap insurance policy. Um, they don't hurt it or add flavor or anything. Yeah. Could you use citric acid if no lemons on hand? I would not do that. Um, I would add fruit. Depends where you live and what you can get your hands on. Yeah. The whole idea is that you don't can go pick it in the woods, not have to go to the grocery store. Yeah. I would probably go just with without yeah. entirely. So there was a comment here for the ones that really want to learn the proper way to make mead, go watch City Stead Brew. Yeah, so like there's always gonna be the proper, right, perfect way to make something. Like but if you are worried about everything being the perfect, proper way, you're probably never going to start. So if you're happy to make something that is delicious and uses what is locally available resources, that's, you know, that is good enough for us. We have I make it this way so I, because I can go into the bush and make it. I don't have to go anywhere. It is apocalypse proof alcohol, friends. That's um, why I learned how to make it. Yeah, that that's why. Okay, so where we live in 2020, when there started being supply chain issues, it was wild, friends. Like we live at the end of a supply chain run and you didn't know what you could get at the grocery store. And you couldn't just buy some things at the grocery store. And there was points where Marius was working away and he wasn't allowed to leave where he was because if they left, they wouldn't be allowed back. And I don't want to get into politics here. I'm just talking about logistics. So you weren't allowed to bring kids to the grocery store. And I was home alone with four kids. Like we want to be able to make things without always having to go 
buy things. So this is why we adapted this method. And we've actually now tried three different me meadery, you would call it, yeah. Meads from meadery. And we don't actually like them that much. You can tell that they're like hyper filtered and processed and sulfur because they have to add sulfur when they bottle it and we don't love it. So this is our favorite method. Do you want to start dealing with the trade this for nothing. What yeah. Do you want me to do? Okay, so we need two slices of lemon for a gallon jug. Um, we want the zest and we want the juice, the pith, the white stuff is bitter. We don't want that. So while he's working on the lemon, I'm gonna start on the fruit. So the easiest way to get this in and out of the jug is to puree the berries. So, we are going to dump the berries into the blender. And I'm going to do not just huckleberries, but wild rose petals. These are so delicious. I love them. Roses are pretty magical. They add a really good flavor where we used to live they made wild rose gelato. There was a gelato factory and wild rose gelato was Marius's absolute favorite. Okay, that bowl is very cold because those were in the freezer. Um, but the people said you either love wild rose or you hate wild rose, the gelato. I find the mead, your wild rose mead is popular, right? Mm -hmm. So I had a, a seed swap party in January. I think. Yeah. And Marius, thank you. Marius took out like six different types of mead. And my friends, we were just, you know, having little bits and trying all the different ones. And Marius was taking notes on which were the favorites because what we found very much is that men have different favorites than women. Way different. Yeah, way different tastes from men to women on which meads they like. So women love the rose and the dandelion, right? Yep, I like the dandelion. Marius yeah. really loves the dandelion too, but women love the rose. Men are like, Meh, whatever. So what's special about roses is that roses in herbal medicine, they open your heart. And this is like a little bit woo woo, but you know, it does, roses like relax you and they allow you to like release and release emotions and this is a good thing. Okay, so I'm gonna throw the rose petals in there too. You can dry rose petals and for tea we dry rose petals, but Marius wanted to have all the like essential oils that might potentially burn off when you dehydrated them intact for making the rose mead. So he froze just some containers of them. We have wild roses that grow everywhere. You could also use a rose in your garden, as long as it's been in your garden at least a year, because when they come from a nursery, they are sprayed the bejesus out of. So we don't want that. You want to just, um, you want to make sure that it's a clean rose petal and they're not sprayed with all that gross stuff. And you can also, if you're at someone's house and they have beautiful roses and you know that they don't spray their roses, when the roses are starting to like um, wilt a little bit, Soon they're gonna drop anyway, so I'll just be like, hey, can I have your rose petals? And they're always like, absolutely, sure. And they get me a container and I pick their rose petals and I've gone home with like gallon bags full of rose petals from people's houses. So we have, Mary's took, just took the peel. Did you use a paring knife or a peeler? Paring. He used a paring knife and just took just the peel, no pith. So the plan was that I was just gonna do this video on my own and then like an hour or two ago, I started being like, I'm in over my head. <laughs> so he offered to join me. Um, okay, so I'm only using the juice because there is the white pith on these and we don't want that. We just want the juice. Oh, there's a question. For the one gallon recipe, is it roughly one pound of fruit no matter what type as long as it's acidic plus 12 raisins, three pounds honey, water to cover? Yes. So anybody that signed up for this class got an email with the recipe and I will resend it or um, later. 
um, if you if you missed it, I can resend it. Um, but yes, it's pretty much one pound of fruit, always. You could add more. You could, yeah, I think that'd be too much though. Um, and if you didn't have lemons on hand, could you just use some lemon juice? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. I've done that a few times. It didn't seem to change anything. Sorry, this is going to be loud. I thought about doing this beforehand, but... Okay, that's good enough. I didn't make it go high speed, so it stayed quiet. I recently downsized all my funnels because I had way too many funnels. But I think I didn't think about mead making. Where's my red funnel? Um, I don't know where your red funnel is. With your mead making stuff? Mm -hmm. Mary has a big red funnel. Have we done any mead with apples? No, we haven't. We thought about it. Marius even went through the effort of grinding and straining juice out of little apples, and then we put it in a freezer, and then the freezer thawed. It was a fridge freezer that was not reliable, so we have not done that. Um, apple mead is called Sizer, C-Y-S-E-R, and I did try a store-bought mead. Can't find your funnel? I know I didn't get rid of that funnel. Oh, I just got put away somewhere. It should be. But, um... <laughs> Someone says the funnel might be on the top of the cover. No, that's a, it's a lid. ice cream bucket lid, but I appreciate you. <laughs> you helping us look. Okay, we're just going to try it with this, I guess. Okay. So, I have a clean one-gallon jug. And... It doesn't need to have a lid, but this one does have a lid. So, fingers crossed, otherwise I might need to blend this a bit more. I should have blended this a bit more. I really lack patience. <laughs> patience is not my strong suit. There we go. Um, we were doing these cow pregnancy tests and the blood had coagulated. This is maybe not a good conversation to have while dealing with these berries, but it wouldn't move up the test. And I was like, well, it's not working. I'll do a new one. So I started a new one. And by the time I started a new one, the other one was working. And Marius is like, see, I told you, you just needed to be patient. So there you go. What fruit have you paired with dandelion? Nothing. We do just dandelion. Just dandelion, just wild rose. What other flower ones have you done? Wild rose grapefruit. I put the roses in with lots of different fruit. But dandelion is absolutely superb all by itself. After a year was when it really started getting good. Before that it was wasn't very it was really acidic. And after a year, it mellowed right out. And it is by far my favorite. I'm anxiously awaiting dandelions starting to grow. Okay, I need something that can uh, go in there. So it's my instant read thermometer. Um, some meads are delicious to drink right when they're done fermenting. Some of them need to age. So if you taste your mead and you're like, this is really nothing special, just put it away and forget about it for six months and there you go yeah it gets better yeah okay another question can jugs be plastic yes and no mm, preferably not i've never used plastic so i don't know if it would change anything but if 
it's all you have, then I don't see why it wouldn't work. But I have never tried. Okay, there we go. Okay. Will the video be available later? This person missed the first 15 minutes. Yes. One of the reasons I chose to do this through YouTube is that when it's this we're done, it will process and then it will be posted and live and available for anybody to view. So the replay will be available as soon as YouTube processes it, which is probably as soon as our rural internet does it, which it'll be this afternoon probably. Okay. Do you clean the jugs with anything special? No, I use hot water. I have only ever used hot water and I've never had an issue, but over cleaning it is not a bad thing either. I just don't. You can get, what do they call it? What's that stuff I got? It's oh. for cleaning bottles. It sterilizes the bottle. Yeah, you can get it from the... A U or yeah. something like that. Okay, so the honey, I need to dissolve it in some water for it to go into the jug well and mix well. So I'm just using the bowl that I used for huckleberries. And I know that a quart jar is three pounds of honey because someone, someone told me that. I told you that. Someone else told me that too, I think. Anyhow, I actually picked our honey versus another honey only because our honey is super runny because we just extracted it and the other honey is not as runny. So this is way easier. If your honey is not runny, this warm is great, it up. warm it up. But you don't want to kill those things. So your best bet is to just put your thing of honey in a bigger pot or bucket of warm water to warm it up like that. Or even keeping it in your house. If your house is 20 degrees, that's fine. Yeah, like if you've had it in, like we'll often have it in a storage room that's cool. cooler. So we'll bring it into our main area of our house to warm it up. Where's your lid? Uh, my lid is right here. Use water here if you want. Can you, okay, sorry. Just dandelion flowers or the leaves too? Oh no, just the flower Just petals. the yellow part. You have to pluck. <laughs> It's a lot of work. Where's my jar? Um, Marius, you should explain to them your method. Yeah, it's kind of hard. Where's uh, my dandelion? Oh, it's down there, I think. Down where? In the bottom of the hutch. Our kids are playing outside right now. We send them outside with water bottles and some snacks, and we're like, don't come back till we ask you to. So. It's a beautiful sunny day. Um, our weather went from winter, like it was below freezing last night, to summer. There <laughs> you go. Yeah, so this That's is- what 10,000 dandelions looks like. Yeah, so Marius did dry the dandelions versus freezing them. Okay, show them your method. You gotta stand up so they can see your hands. You just twist it. So you pick them at what point in the day? Uh, I like around lunchtime or early afternoon, that way the dandelions have opened up all the way that they're gonna open up. And I find them easier to take apart, but you, you grab the green part and just kind of twist it. And the petals, usually most of them just fall out into your basket or whatever. Um, some of them you have to pluck away and keep, be diligent and keep the green stuff out. It's very that tedious. Will make it better. He says the best way to do it is to get yourself a glass of mead and sit down and work on plucking them. And Freya and Rowan. Oh, the girls love to pick, pick flowers. flowers for me. I just park a chair in the grass and. Could you hold the funnel for me? I'm a little nervous. Okay. Sorry, we have to concentrate on this. I can't look at your questions right <laughs> now. Yeah, I could only add a bit of water because You're this bowl apparently doesn't... Oh yeah, I know. This bowl doesn't have very good capacity. I should have used a bigger bowl. This is one if Marius is doing a big batch, then he will just mix it in the bucket first. Actually, after we're done doing this, I would like if you could grab one of your brew buckets and an empty carboy and we could quickly explain the process if you were doing it on a bigger batch. 
because I did include the recipe for a bigger batch and the instructions. Okay. Just to show how it is if you're making a big batch. <clears throat> okay, can you stop the fermentation early if you like the taste and you don't want it to keep going? Yeah, just start drinking it. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't bottle it. You can drink it at any point, but you can't bottle it till the fermentation is done, or you're just going to have bottles blow up. They will blow up. Um, you could keep it in the fridge, and that would slow and stop the fermentation. But realistically, if you like it, just start drinking it. Like <clears throat> this blueberry, we started tasting with friends, and it's not even done fermenting, um, but we just wanted to try it because we've never tried blueberry before. Okay, so we have our honey our fruit, our roses, our lemons. It is raisin time. Just put them there out of the way for now. Um, two, three, four, five, if six. If you like it, drink it. Yeah, if you like it, start drinking it. Okay, so we added our raisins. That one ran away on the counter. An optional thing that you obviously will not have on your first batch, but if you are making mead on a semi-regular basis, like every two or three months, you will have an active ferment. And this active ferment is like, it's a starter. It's an active mead starter. It's, it's, like a, it's like your sourdough starter or your clabber. This is active, healthy mead. And we're gonna add some of this to this to jumpstart it. So if we have one available, we always use it because it just helps jumpstart it and why not? So I'll probably add a cup. Roughly, I'm not measuring, obviously. So that just adds some nice yeast in there. And, uh, okay, active, oh. active. active yeasts. My computer went to sleep. Okay. Um, if you only have access to store bought raw honey, would adding extra raisins help with the yeast and success? I would look at the jar of honey. Or even in like, they probably have a brand name. You could look them up, see if they say anything about how they process honey. Otherwise. Well, there, there's some recipes that call for heating honey. Yeah, so. But they go about the process differently. That's why we don't yeah. do it. because You could use bread yeast. We have done that before. Or you can buy champagne yeast. That's what this is. Yeah, this is a champ, a champagne yeast from the U brew. And Marius occasionally uses these if it is winter and it's cold in our house. It can be hard for the yeast to get going in a cold house. And like when he made the grapefruit rose, those were store-bought grapefruits. So we already knew he was starting with less yeasts and then he added in the yeast just because it was cold and he was starting with yes, less yeast and yeah. The other it reason- goes quite a bit faster. The other reason, so if you think of making yeasted bread versus sourdough bread, yeasted bread, you mix it in an hour, you're shaping it, half an hour you're baking it, and within a few hours you're eating bread. Sourdough bread, you have to feed your starter and then your starter has to rise and then your bread takes like 12 hours to rise and then it takes a few hours to rise after you shaped it and bake it. This is the same with using a powdered yeast in mead versus relying on the wild fermentation. Same with sourdough bread. Your bread could be ready in six hours to shape or it could be ready in 12 hours. It's the same with wild ferments. It could be ready to bottle in two months. It could be six months. So seven was the longest. Seven, seven was the longest. So we actually did this winter. We were on it. It was good. <laughs> yeah. So if you are on a timeline, this is when you might want to consider using yeast. But I'm not adding those. I add that. Okay, so then my last thing is just top it up with water. So when fermentation takes off, your fruit is all gonna rise. And if your jug is too full, it's gonna blow. So this is how much water Marius wants me to add. I usually add more than that. Like you can see in this one, the line where the fruit was, it was like right there. And we've had some all over the counter. We've had some blow. It's really, really gross. 
it's a lot of sticky mess. Um, if you're using something like ginger, are the amounts the same? How much ginger would you add? Like if I was making a gallon jug, I would not use a pound of ginger. Oh. No, that would be like medicinal level, take a sip. I would use probably like a, a knob of ginger. Yeah. Like a knob the size of your thumb is probably about how much ginger would be right in this. And then you would just be adding more water because you don't have the fruit in there and yeah. Does the dandelion come, flavor come through or does it taste more like honey mead? It's so floral. It, it, yeah, it doesn't really I'm remind you of dandelion. Okay, we'll cover it good there. Okay. The floral comes through, but it's not like eating a dandelion. I don't know if anyone's ever eaten one. I have eaten lots of them, and yeah. it, it's not the same as that. Same with the rose. It doesn't taste like Punching eating a rose, rose petal. It has its own unique yeah. flavor. Um... Since I didn't stir my honey very well, I put the lid on and I'm gonna shake this a little bit just to make sure that that honey is properly in there. Do dried flowers work well as fresh flowers? I prefer fresh, fresh is best, but I dry them and use them anyway. Um, how long does mead last? Forever. Uh, well. <laughs> A couple, long couple <laughs> months, depending on how many people you have over. <laughs> you can age it for years and years and years. There's guy, the guy, one of the guy I talked to at the Uber said, don't even drink it till it's 10 years old. And we're so, like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and that's impossible. <laughs> um, how many ounces of dandelion for one pound of mead? How many ounces? How much dandelion did you use? How much did you tell Simon to use? So Marius usually uses fresh ones in a big batch, but he did give these to his brother. This jar was full and his brother used just what was in the neck. How many ounces did it be? Don't so probably many. like a handful of dried. So remember that dried are like a third of the volume of fresh usually. When I did fresh ones, I used a whole jar of that size for five gallons. You used a two quart or a one quart? What, That's a one that and a half quart. That's yeah. a funky size. Well, it would have been a two quart then, because I filled the whole jar up. Okay. That did five gallons, but weight wise, I have no idea how much that was. It was packed in there though. Um, can we reuse our raisins? We froze them after our first amazing batch of mead. It would add good yeasts. I don't see why not. It's a good question. I have no idea. I how. think so. I think it would be adding good ones. You can always try and find out. If it doesn't work and nothing happens, just add some fresh ones in. Okay, so I since see why, why not. since I don't have a balloon, I was gonna show you with a balloon, but um, I'm doing an airlock. These are very inexpensive. Um, and it is easier to see the fermentation with an airlock. So then it just pops in here and you can tell when the fermentation takes off because, actually, I'm just gonna take you and show you a couple jugs here. We're gonna flip you around into the cupboard. So you can watch the airlock here. How long are we gonna have to watch this? There you go, see how that thing went up? That shows you that fermentation is active. So this is one with pineapple, and these are store-bought pineapples, and pineapples have so many good yeasts in them, you just use the scraps that you cut off, you don't even use the flesh and I used two large pineapples for a five gallon batch. This is a honeycomb chai. So when you, um, ex when you extract honey, I'm gonna flip you back around here. So when you extract honey, you, um, like you scrape off, like the bees cap the honeycomb, right? And you scrape it off and you have all these cappings and those cappings are really annoying to deal with. So I saw this recipe that I had to try that uses all the cappings so you don't have to filter them. So you just use honey with the cappings. And then I also steep some chai tea for the tannins and for the spices. And this one smells so amazing. And then this one is just uh, mixed berries from the freezer. <laughs> and, oh, it just went up on me. Let's see, there we go. The other thing, Mary, could you grab your phone so I could 
use your flashlight. The other way to know if your fermentation is active here. Oh my, I'm just getting a flashlight for you here. Is, oh, can you see it? I'm trying to show you just the fruit moving around. Ah, here we go. This one you can see. Maybe not. This is really hard to show. Basically, the fruit is moving around and there's bubbles all along the top. And the fruit is actually moving up and down and all around. Okay. Let's put you back over here. Okay, we got some more questions. Do you have to be careful of the alcohol content as it ages? Nope. I don't see why not. It, it's not going to get... Yeah, if you can get it to 18%, you're doing real good. Yeah. Most of mine are between 10 and 16. And we have never tested it. We have never used a hygrometer. We've never, yeah, tested the alcohol content. We just embrace the Viking way of just guessing. We also think it's fun to, like people to guess, like, what percentage do you think it is? So, there you go. Oh, you, you can drink it side by side with a wine that you know what the alcohol content is, yeah. and you'll know right away if you're, what, what ballpark you're in. Yeah. But for an exact, accurate measurement, I don't care enough to uh, figure it out. So the last <laughs> step that is important that you're gonna have to do for a few days before you can leave this be, is you need to swirl your jug to help aerate and encourage the yeasts. And if after two or three days, your um, fermentation hasn't taken off, if you're using a balloon, the balloon will stand erect um, or the airlock will start bubbling. And if it doesn't take off after a few days, then you can take the balloon off or take the plug off and cover it with something so no bugs get in, right? And just let it have air for half a day and then go back to your swirling. And then that will usually help it take off. If you're like over a week and nothing is taken off, that's when I would consider like dissolving some yeast in a bit of warm water and putting it in to see if you can kick it off. Very, very, very rarely have I heard of that happening. And we've never had it test. We've, have you added yeast down the road? No, never had. he either does it right away because he's made the decision based on what he's making or it just takes off. Um, someone found a box of mead in their barn from 2017. It's delicious. So that sounds great. Okay, so this- Six years old, that, I bet it's good. We're just gonna tuck this to the side now. On, I'm gonna leave it on the counter until the fermentation is taken off so that I can keep an eye on it. And then after the fermentation takes off, then we tuck it away in a cupboard. So these glass jugs, these ones specifically, some of these are like apple juice jugs. You can buy apple juice at our grocery stores in these. Some of them are bought from Uline. Um, so now we're going to quickly show you the tools we use when we're making a big batch of meat. Do you want to grab those? Yeah. Okay, the other question was how do you dry your dandelions? In a cardboard box. Like, like a the popper beer, beer flat box, and you just once a day That's... fluff them up and. Okay, so I was gonna tell a story oh, about your grandpa earlier. Okay, so Marius's grandpa is also Marius, but he's called Mac, just like our Mac. Our Mac is also Marius. There's four of them. Um this he is super into <laughs> Like whatever he does, he's like very intensely does. Like he is a purist, I would say in a lot of ways. Like he will not rototill his garden. He will only like hand turn it. He will not use a hose or a pump. He packs water from a creek and waters his garden. He is old school. a purist to a fault. He also won't accept help. So that is how Marius's grandpa dries, he dries piles of herbs from his garden and all these things, and he does them all. I don't think they own a dehydrator. No, he does piles of herbs, just he has those cardboard beer flats, and they just put them, like we end up with it all over our house too, like they're all over every surface in summer. Beetles. And 
Yeah, well, <laughs> vehicle doesn't work because uh, we don't like that so much. But just in your house. And then you just like ruffle with your hands once a day and usually something like calendula or oregano that, you know, I'm picking more on a regular basis. Every time I add them to the box, I just give them a gentle stir around. So then Mary's his grandpa, he makes wine and he makes it from wild fruit that he picks. Like he won't use strawberries from uh, th his garden even, or he would never buy strawberries to make wine. He makes wine. He will only use the wild strawberries because he said those taste the best. They do. <laughs> so, um, yeah. The other thing though, is he uses the same recipe that the Ubrew uses. He got his recipe from the Ubrew decades ago. And he brought them wine one time to be like, what do you think of my wine? And they were like, this is amazing. What recipe do you use in there? And he's like, we use your recipe. This is your recipe. And they narrowed it down to the reason his mead is so good. Wine. It's wine, sorry, he makes wine, not mead. The reason his wine is so good is the creek water. He uses glacier runoff creek water in his wine. And he swears that is the difference, the quality of the water. So there you go. Oh, someone asked, this is, you'll like this question. Have we done sour cherry? Sour cherry is our very favorite. This is sour cherry. Sour cherry is beautiful. It's delicious. If you leave like a few pits in too, um, cherry pits have like an almond extract taste and it just gives you like this little undertone. So it doesn't need any more honey, still follow the same recipe. It is amazing. Sour cherry is and like- it's good right away. Yeah. You don't have to age it, but it, it and it, it gets better, but yeah. it is good right away. Um, does it become stronger the longer it sits? Uh, no. I don't think so. Once your fermentation is done, that's as far as it's going to go. And it's just going to, what, what, what changes is the flavors change. The acidity will mellow out. Yeah. She'll try it and it'll be too acidic and you won't like it. But like two months later, you try it again and you, it, it's mellowed right out. So what, yeah. your flavors change, not the alcohol. So this is a seven gallon bucket. You can buy these at Uline or at Ubrews. We have a friend, okay, Elaine. If you guys make Elaine's bread from my blog, if you make Elaine's ice cream from my blog, this is, um, Elaine also makes wine. And Elaine uh, basically peer pressured Marius into taking all of her extra equipment because she was like, I have way too much stuff. Here, come over, I need to give you some things. And he came <laughs> home, they can't see your face. He came home at the back of his car, like he drives a hatchback and he always has his seats down. So he has like the whole thing. He hunts in that car, everything. Um, he came home with a back full of carboys and brew buckets and a filter press and all these things that a lot of these things honestly we're not gonna use. But the brew bucket is super helpful. So if you're making a five gallon batch of mead, um, what you're gonna do is you're going to, Marius will, um, so he has the water in a five gallon bucket because it's a lot of water to chlorine off gas. He had to go check in with the kids there. <laughs> um, so he'll do the honey in the bucket. And for the five gallon batch, it uses seven kilos of honey. And our seven kilo is a standard bucket. If that's 15 pounds, five quarts, that's a standard bucket size that you can buy honey in. So that makes it super easy. We don't have to measure honey. We just dump the seven kilo in add some of the water, stir it well, add your pureed fruit. Usually Mary needs to do the fruit in multiple batches in the blender because it's a lot more fruit, but it goes in and then he adds the water up to... Wait. Oh, this one doesn't have one. The other ones have where it's marked, it says 23 liters and we fill it up to there, which is basically about here. And then instead of swirling the jug, you're going to stir this to create a cyclone and then cover it in this. Although Marius <laughs> discovered, okay, one- You can do that. Okay, so one time our friends needed to dump an entire tank of their milk because of oversupply. Um, so they made butter 
for themselves and we helped them. And we used a drywall mixer in five gallon buckets to make butter because we were making so much butter for them. Cause they were like, we have no idea how to make butter. And we were like, we do, we can help you. So we bought this. And then Mary's discovered, is this attaches to your drill. Um, it, I had known that before that it attaches. Okay, he knew it attached to his drill. Marius is a carpenter by trade. He has drywalled before. But he it's discovered <laughs> this work. It's a paint mixer. Okay, this is a paint mixer, not a drywall mixer. Yeah. What is it? Okay. It's way easier to stir your mead with that. Yes, this stirs your mead very, very well. In 30 seconds, as yes. opposed to the stick, which takes like 15 minutes. It does not take 15 minutes. I to stirred it, it properly, for like a minute. To do it properly. I did it for a minute with a wooden spoon. It's fine. Um, just to stir. Anyhow. So then, then when you do it in this and you stir it a couple times a day, then if you want to make mead like Mary's, you need to obsessively check it. Listen for the fermentation. Listen again, listen again. He'll like come and then he'll go to, like, to knock it. And you'll hear it like. You can't hear it probably on the phone, but if you stick your head in that cupboard, it's loud. You hear like. So all the, the fermentation. carboys are just bubbling away. So this book he read, they call it the pixies are dancing. <laughs> so when the pixies are dancing, then it gets moved into the carboy. And this, um, this is a six gallon carboy. We actually like six yep. gallon carboys over five gallon carboys because we can make a five gallon batch and then still have some headroom so that we don't blow the top with the fruit. So Mary says bigger funnel, wherever that funnel is. I really hope I didn't get rid of it in my decluttering. Um, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten rid of that funnel. I know you love it. Um, yeah, that goes in there and then it easily airlocks when you're trying to put it in there. So he actually has, he uses paracord. You could use, strings, a, you know, string, a thick anything. cotton string, whatever, and dangle a bit in there before you put your funnel in so that it doesn't airlock when you're trying to pour it in. Um, so it makes a mess. Yeah. So then you fill it up, you put this in, you'll see it bubbling away. He usually keeps it on the counter for a few days to keep an eye on it. And then it gets moved out of the kitchen because I get tired of having them in the kitchen. Um, okay, so when the mead is finished, and this is gonna answer the next couple questions. First of all, we'll just answer, can I make one gallon recipe and divide it into half gallon jars? Absolutely. Um, things do ferment and age differently in different size vessels. Not bad, just different. It might be, it's different timelines. So just, have some grace with yourself if it's like on a slightly different timeline than something we're doing because you use a different size jug. There's so many factors, the temperature of your house, the honey you use, whatever. You just need to trust the process and just obsessively check it three times a day just to make sure that it's still working, which. We've made side by side, one gallon identical, yeah. same fruit from the same tree, from the same picking. And one was finished probably a month or more yeah. than the other one. Okay, so when fermentation <laughs> is done, some clues that fermentation are slowing down is that your airlock is bubbling slower or stopped bubbling. Mm -hmm. Your balloon starts to go limp. Make sure your balloon didn't like actually get a little hole there. My stepdad was like, oh, this balloon is limp. This one's done. He tried it. He's like, that's definitely not done. And it turned out the balloon had just corroded a little hole right at the neck of the bottle. So he put a new balloon on and then it just kept going and it was fine. The other thing that mead will do is it will clarify things. All that sediment will settle. If you like put a flashlight on it, you'll no longer see fruit. Like fruit will be like gently moving around. It won't be fast, but it will be gently moving around. That will have all settled. Some um, of them are fast. Yeah, sometimes there is fruit sour rocketing cherry, around. In sour there. cherry is violent. Like it. But it, it becomes great. clearer, you can see through it, unless the blueberry. The blueberry is so dark you can't see through it. But most of them, like especially something like a sour cherry, you can see through it. Whereas if this was still fermenting, it would be cloudy and not as clear. So those are some different cues to know when it's done. And then if Marius is making a big batch at that point, he will rack it, which means moving it to another carboy. 
So he has a siphon and he doesn't go all the way to the bottom He so because there's, there's going to be sediment and fruit in the bottom. So he'll have his siphon above that, siphon out the clear stuff, and then that sedimenty stuff, he'll put it into... No, we don't need it. He'll put that into something else for that to settle. And then that mead Would will often... Of yeah, there is a jug yeah. That mead with the sediment and stuff in it, we'll use it for cooking mead because... Oh, it's like a glass quart jar. It's pretty clear. It's in there. I know what it is. It's like a... I think it's the grapefruit. Um... Oh, where is it though? It's in that cupboard. Okay. Ah. Oh, it's a, ended up at the back. So because we don't necessarily want to drink it with all the sediment, but it makes such good cooking yeah, alcohol. You can see the yeah, so you can see like the sediment and everything, and you could still very much drink this top part, but we just use this all um, for cooking. cooking. Um, so or it what marinades. or marinades or like putting it in with your pot roast, that sort of thing. At what point do you strain the mead? Do you strain it and then rack it, or do you oh, rack? It's it? the, oh, when do you strain it? We do strain it, but the, we don't filter it. Is the difference? I, I I leave the fruit in until it's done. Yeah. Once it's stopped being active, then I strain everything out. This one? And let it sit and then do it again when it's like this. This one you can cut. Uh, no, you can't actually tell on this blueberry. You can kind of tell there's a darker spot in the bottom, but the blueberry is really hard to tell with that. Um, I don't, I don't uh, strain it till it's finished. Though. Yeah, so when it's finished fermenting, he strains it, then lets the sediment settle, then bottles it. So when we're bottling jugs... Sometimes you can get your siphon through and do both at the same time your fruit stays up high and slowly starts sinking as your meads coming out through the siphon and you stay up off the bottom so your lees or your sediment stays on the bottom and it, as they come together at the right moment you pull your siphon out and but it doesn't always work sometimes yeah. the fruit plugs up the siphon so if you care about a really perfect end product after you've strained it you would Probably rack it multiple times and you yeah, would that up in front of them. Um, that's how filtered it is <laughs> and then you would put it through a filter press which is for winemaking so this is a strawberry and it looks nice and clear but actually at the bottom there is some sediment that oh. hmm? well, there you go that so you can see then it's not cloudy there anymore <laughs> the sediment is not bad for you it's probably just a different mouth feel it, it depends if you care that it. much. You can filter it and filter it and filter it till there's nothing left. Like, okay. We just don't care. It's another messy step and we don't care. Um, where do we get our sour cherries and have you ever used whole sour cherries without pitting? We get our sour cherries off the tree in our front yard. And Which... yes, I did a batch. They, they get pitted because I put them in the blender because they're easier to get in and out of a carboy if they're in teeny little pieces. So they, in a way, they are pitted. But do you use all the pits and the fruit? I have, yeah. Yeah. I did a whole batch that way, and that was the one you liked the that nutty flavor. That little almond of. undertone is good. Yeah. Saskatoons have that undertone, too. Mm -hmm. um, this is... Us moving is still a very up in the air thing. We may be staying here. If we move, um, one thing Mary is sad about is our sour cherry trees would stay here. Yeah, or I'll dig them up. I don't, I don't think we could dig them up. They're pretty established. Yeah. I got three huge bags in the freezer still yeah. of sour cherries. Yeah. Um, racking is basically siphoning from one jug to another but you don't stick the siphon all the way down to the bottom so that you don't take that fruit and sediment up. You're only taking the clear liquid and moving it to another jug. No, you leave this part. You leave this part in your carboy. Racking is like a wine making term for the most part. And people like rack multiple times and this and we don't, we just rack as part of the- Twice would be the max. Twice would be the max. For me anyway. Um, 
<laughs> well, it gets back three times because I do it again when I'm bottling it. I siphon yeah. it again. So one person said, just move right before, right after we harvest. <laughs> oh, it's crossed my mind. Another thing too, like we have so much garlic planted. Digging like, the tree up has also crossed my mind. Um, but you have to move at the right time of year to dig up a tree. Um, so it has been an hour now. So it is time to let you guys go. Unless you have any more questions. Let's just open this up for questions for a bit and then we'll wrap it up. Do you have to rack it? No. When I have done one gallon batches, mm -hmm. I just put them through like a strainer, like a fine mesh strainer to get the big chunkies out and then bottle it and that's it. Um, I'm not too concerned about racking it. I'd recommend that you're gonna have chunkies and floaters in there. You don't so have to though. Depends how. You don't mind chewing on stuff while you're drinking it. And it I didn't get any of that in it. Um, okay, what other ones do we have here? What about taking cuttings of the tree? I don't think that works with sour cherries. My mom could probably graft it. My mom grafts trees. Mom is watching this right now. Hey, mom. Cuttings. <laughs> you're here you could in a couple cuttings. weeks. Why don't you graft some sour cherry trees you for us? Take cuttings too. Um, when you say filter it after racking, are you just running it through a coffee milk filter? Um, you could for sure. When people talk about filtering with alcohol, they talk about a filter press and it's like an electric thing that like, it like has a hose that sucks in and then it like goes out the other side. Um, the Very other place you could see a filter, filter press would be um, the Gateway Farm maple syrup on Instagram they have videos of them filtering maple syrup and it's the exact same thing, their filter press. Can you use crystallized honey? Yep. Absolutely. Um, it's just harder to work with. You just have to warm it up in the warm water gently to make sure that you don't kill yeast. Um, I, I've done it and I haven't even warmed it up. I just let it sit in, on the counter for two days. And it was room temperature and it's not going to flow the same way. No, you're like, going to have to stir it in the water more when it you up, are it, it mixes up just as easily as yeah. honey that flows. What is your all time favorite combo? Mm. Is that a you question or a me question? That's a you question. No, uh, combo? Or like whatever, what is your favorite mead you ever made? Probably the sour cherry. Sour cherry is pretty top there. Right? Sour cherry and dandelion are like great neck and neck with each other. Yeah. Could you use canned fruit? Yes, but you could not rely on it for any yeasts. You could only rely on it for flavor. flavor. Yeah. Um, it'd, be, it'd be hard, I don't know. Yeah. I also wanted to say, here's a shameless plug for you guys. This is something that we taught in our membership, Homesteading Without the BS. And there was more involved. There's more than just the recipe. There was like a cost breakdown and different tools involved and different, there was like a frequently asked questions and you know, there was more stuff involved there. Um, as well as we did a mead make along in Instagram close friend stories, all insiders can request to join the close friend story and we do a lot more in-depth thing like right now we're actually doing an instagram close friend story we're doing making non-alcoholic sodas cream soda ginger beer and orange soda that are super simple to make and fun to make so you can find more about that at venisonfordinner.com um this month's focus topic is all about livestock what's in our vet kit and what non-vet related preparedness, like what non-medical preparedness do you need for your animals? Just some interesting things to think through before you get livestock. So I wanted to touch on bottling here quickly. These are three different types of bottles we have. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So Mary's has a special bucket with a spigot for bottling, which if you saw my reel on this class, it included that. So this is a Grolsch top bottle. This is the very best. Um, it's completely reusable. So 
apocalypse proof. It seals well. It looks pretty. You can get Girl's Chop beer bottles. This is a cider bottle. Girl's Chop is your absolute top one to get. Um, so what you, what you gotta do is you gotta get your friends and family knowing that you want high quality liquor bottles and then they start collecting them for you. Which we have a family member, actually this is a me, uh, moonshine that I bought. We have a family member who drinks whiskey with these cork tops. They're like a, do you have an open one of these? Let me see. And they save them for us. So oh, if it's one that doesn't one. seal oh, yeah. like the girl shop, so this one here, this is one of the whiskey bottles. Um, it, this, it's like a reusable cork. So as a precaution, because occasionally these really aren't quite airtight after they're open, Marius just tapes them with masking tape. Oh, the corks dry out. Yeah, the corks dry out. Or they came dried out. Unless you store them on your, their side, then the cork won't dry out. But because we don't do that many cork bottles, we don't store them on their side. The other type you can use is this is just a wine bottle with <laughs> Both twist the plastic. Whiskey um, bottles. Oh, we do even have like vodka bottles because we buy like the huge bottles of vodka for making tinctures. And then we save those and, re and reuse those. So those are fun. He went to get one of those. Okay, so here is his bottling bucket. So he would rack it into this and then this twists down and he puts it over the edge of the counter and then he can bottle them all really easily when he's doing lots. These are great. <laughs> they hold a lot and you yeah. drop them and they don't break. Yeah, so these are um, what we buy for making tinctures and such. And we see, see the them. cloudy, show them the cloudy. Oh yeah, stir. you could, I did, did just stir up some cloudiness there, but it's fine. And these are like, if we're bringing mead somewhere, like it, when we went away and we wanted to bring mead to share with friends, we bring these because then we're not packing glass bottles. So there you go. We drink this first usually and age. Yes, so we'll drink the plastic ones first and then age in the glass ones. There you go. If you did not get the mead recipe, um, either in the YouTube community tab, if you sign up for this class, even though this class is done, you will get sent the recipe or on Instagram and in Instagram stories, there's links there. And if you sign up for the class, you'll get sent the recipe, um, for the one gallon and to make a big carboy. And those carboys, the big glass ones, new, they're actually only like 60 bucks. They're not actually that expensive for being such a large amount of glass. But what, why, why, we, so? why we ended up with so many of them is that you also can find them used. So Marius's brother was like, oh, I found some used. I'm going to buy them for you. How many do you want? He has 30 and Marius is like, oh no, not 30, not 30. We still ended up with too many because then Elaine gave you some. Yeah. They and we ended up with too many. Flooding the house. But we had, we had friends visiting recently and they've started brewing mead in the one gallon jugs and we sent them home with two of the five gallon ones. We're like, here, take these and make bigger batches now. Oh, not yet, Freya. Yeah, just a second, Freya. So it seems like our children are done here and that we should wrap this up. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. And remember, you can find us at venisonfordinner.com. You can find us at venisonfordinner on Instagram. You can find us, we're here on YouTube, obviously. So just make sure you're subscribed. We do a weekly video on Wednesdays and this was very fun. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Have fun making mead. Yes, have fun making mead.